<laughs> so it's a delight to be with you here this morning. How about, how about that silent meditation, right? So Mr. Guenka, where I learned to meditate, he says in his first discourse, the mind is a very, very busy place. And, you know, we don't really find that out until we're just still, right? And uh, so it's my delight to be here. It's fun to be here with Andy, of course, I met years back when he was serving down at Simi Valley. And... Uh, Dr. Moira does say hello, and she sends her love to all of you, and of course, I'm delighted to uh, be here and really uh, honored to be asked to, uh, to speak here at Redondo Beach. And if you are new to the Redondo Beach community, I would just reiterate what Reverend Catherine said, or if this is your first time visiting here online, please know that you are most welcome. And although I am the visiting speaker for today, I do say welcome to our community for I feel a deep tie to Redondo Beach through Reverend Dr. Moyer, of course, and Reverend, Reverend Mary Morgan, we're old chums, and, and Catherine and I were lay people together way back when. And uh, so I just, I know a lot of people through, um, and I've come to know many of you pretty well through our years up the hill at uh, Lake, the Lake Arrowhead Retreat on Memorial Day. So let's just all know in consciousness right now that we will be meeting together up the mountain this year to a sold out Lake Arrowhead experience. And we're saying right now, COVID be gone. Get thee behind me. Because we have some fun awaiting us up the hill. And I don't know about you, but I am ready for that. And yet we have some work ahead of us. That's in May. We've got some work ahead of us before that all happens, yeah? And certainly uh, in the next uh, few months, there's some work ahead of us. And I do want to take some time to honor Justice, uh, the passing and the transition of, of um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a tireless public servant who made the lives of working women more prosperous in real terms of career and compensation, and not from the academic uh, ivory tower of theory, but from her own real experience of struggle in, uh, in coming from a Jewish immigrant family at a time when women and Jews were often not welcome in professional circles. And her victory over those struggles through right thinking and use of the law, her victory over them has made us all winners, regardless of gender. Now, Dr. Sue Rubin, who was down here last week, she posted on Facebook yesterday that in the Jewish tradition, should one pass, so one make their transition on Rosh Hashanah, they are considered a person of perfect righteousness, perfect righteousness. And Dr. Sue goes on to say that metaphysically, this indicates a harmonious state in consciousness attained through the right use of one's God's God-given talents. So there are countless stories on how RBG was able to have deep friendships with folks that she had strong disagreements with philosophically, and yet had obvious affection for, that in a very public way, uh, and she did these things in a very public way, and when she slipped up, she promptly admitted it, which I really admired about her. So in this life of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we can find inspiration for ourselves, and we can also find inspiration in our spiritual tradition that we know as religious science. So Ernest Holmes said that we all look forward to the day when science and religion shall walk hand in hand through the visible to the invisible. Maybe today he would say we all look forward to the day when Democrats and Republicans can walk through the visible to the invisible. How about that? But, but he didn't get caught up in all of that stuff and neither should we. Because when we look out of our front doors, through the portal of our devices, that we see 
What we see in the visible can be overwhelming. And there is a lot, there's a lot going on out there, to be sure. And it is serious business. And it would be easy to discount Ernest Holmes as not knowing what he's talking about because these times are different. But, we, but when we learn more about Ernest, you know, he wrote his first book, Creative Mind, in 1918 when he was 31. It would be easy to forget that in his time, he too saw some crazy times. So think of that, 31 in 1918, two world wars, the, market, the 29 market crash, which we thought was the real crash, right? It was, and, and the depression, which we thought was the depression, of uh, fascism, and the expansion of cosmic states, the building of the, co- the Soviet bloc and, uh, in China, and the nuclear age. All of this must have seemed really dire back in the day. And I know there are some out there still who kind of remember these times. All of this seeming chaos and discord out there. And yet he continued to teach that conscious thought coupled with our connection with the divine can produce a life that not only raises ourselves, but raises the lives of those around us. Because with all that was going on out there, he also witnessed Kitty Hawk, right? and the jet age, and rocketry, and the radio, a radio which helped spread his message and his popularity, the blossoming of a national infrastructure of electrification and freeways and and, uh, electrical generation, the polio vaccine, and social security which I don't know if he would have supported Social Security or not, but, but still, the consciousness spoke in the mid-30s, right? <clears throat> now, Holmes witnessed all of these developments as the logical result of the use of an impersonal law, that the human experience, he recognized and taught, the human experience is one rooted in consciousness, a perfect Cosmic universal love consciousness that is so unconditional that it appears to be impersonal in that its countenance or its effect rains down on the just and the unjust alike through an infinite power of law bound only by the nature of its own being which is infinite and of course bound by what we think of it. Now that's where it gets a little sticky because it's not only what we think about God but more importantly, what we think about ourselves. That this is the limiting factor and the human experience. So our task then is to awaken and to reawaken and to reawaken and to realign and to re-enlighten to this truth, to connect with it, cultivate that connection with daily practice and then daily put it to work. Not simply for the accumulation of stuff and things, but rather to prove or demonstrate the infinite power and presence of the divine expressing as our life. Expressing as our life and expressing uh, in, through, and as the lives of others. Now when we do this, regardless of what we, how we judge how we do it, when we do it, we are practicing the presence. We are practitioners of a scientific approach to spirituality, also known as religious science. So we look at our doorstep, much as Ernest must have done, and witness a world of seeming discord and chaos. So now, now it is most important, like really never before, to remember that as people of faith, we have the gift of awareness 
that informs our experience. That we understand that the, this portal of media outlets and our uh, consumption of it are nothing but signposts. Signposts pointing to what? To our own consciousness. Drats. Our perceptions. Double drats. The way we see the world and the way we see the world together. And what this means, of course, is that if we are distressed, overwhelmed, or even angry at what we are seeing out there, we must first change what's going on up here and in here. Now, Holmes reminds us that science knows nothing of opinion, but recognizes a government of law whose principles are universal. They're available to everyone. So we look away. It's important that we look away from the world of conditions, away from the thought forms of conditioned thought and recognize that we do have conditioned thought and to choose instead to see a field of infinite possibilities for good available to us. Now, this, we can either make this easy on ourselves or difficult. So we can either keep the TV on, CNN or Fox News or MSNBC and all and keep ourselves informed and consume and consume and consume or we can turn all that off and listen to uplifting music. Uh, we can listen to Dr. Moira's YouTube videos. <laughs> you know, we can, there's all kinds of other stuff that we can consume. Now, I speak to this from my own experience because I have been, I, there, there's a, some mountains up there and uh, there actually are hills in Granada Hills and I like to hike in them. And I have found for the last year or two that I consume a lot of commentary, political commentary. And uh, which is great because I'm up there huffing and puffing so it's like really good because I'm like, you know, I'm getting worked up and then I'm getting worked out. And, and this week I just said to myself, you know, I gotta take a break from this stuff. And so I put on Unity online radio and there's guys that I like to listen like uh, Paul John Roach and others. And, and so that's, which is what I used to do uh, on my hike. And I felt like my, my whole attitude just lightened up. That I felt much lighter and in all the stuff in the world was still going on. I was informed but I wasn't getting hooked. So when we look away from the world of conditions, away from the thought forms of conditioned thought and choose instead to see possibilities for good, not playing make-believe, but rather from a place of faith, a place so strong that the cosmic pony, we know the cosmic pony is in that pile somewhere, that God as we understand it is in the mix impressing and expressing itself, awaiting our recognition of it, and to call it forth. So it's not just enough to know that the light switch is over there, we have to turn it on if we want to see the light. And to create a world that works for everyone, we must attend to our own thinking first. So as Ernest Holmes said that we attract to us what we first become. It is a law that when we see what we want to see, regardless of what happens, we will someday experience the outer, what we have so faithfully seen within. Well, that's fine, er Ernie, but how to do that? That's the big question. So basically, we have to move out of fear and to step into faith. Now, when I look outside in the outer world and find myself getting knotted up inside about, uh, that's really telling me I need to stop. I need to stop and, and acknowledge that I am trading, I am trading in fear rather than faith. That I'm really treading in fear rather than faith. We must move out of fear and step into faith. 
Holmes says in essential earnest that we shouldn't view the state of the world with fear because we shouldn't have any fear. We shouldn't view it with timidity because we shouldn't be timid. But we should view it with intelligence. We should view it with intelligence because the only sin is the lack of intelligence. There is no sin but a mistake and no punishment but a consequence. And then he goes on to say something interesting in this passage. The money that is now, this is Holmes, the money that is now being spent in preparing for war would completely abolish poverty from the earth. It's a terrific thing that right now the world is in a position to do away with impoverishment. It's the kind of guy he was, right? That was in the 50s. And so has there been a time when folks like us need to step up in consciousness and in action to create this world that we say we want, which is a world that works for everyone. Because we're going, and, and the only thing really that is going to, we have to start with the end in mind first. We have to have an active faith, right? The faith of God instead of merely a faith in God. This is Holmes again. No matter what the outside appearance, we must cling steadfastly to the knowledge that God is good, that God is all underneath, above, and round about, just like a Justin Timberlake video. That, <laughs> by the way, just so you know, we have these big screens, and Alexis is showing us all these pictures of you guys dancing at home there. So, so it, it is, is the faith. It's the faith that does the work. Faith is the transparent power of the mind that believes the impossible is possible. Or as Michael Beckwith would say, when you believe more in what you don't see than what you do see, then what you do see you won't see, and what you don't see you will see. So I'm going to say that again because it is rather clever. When you believe more in what you don't see in that outer world than in what you do see, then what you do see, you won't see. And what you don't see, you will see. So this is where his idea of vision, we must have a vision for what it is that we want to call forth. That's what we're keeping our eyes single on. And that is what a spiritual mind treatment is. Right? A vision is creating that spiritual prototype that seed thought that we are gonna work with to allow the law then to demonstrate the infinite power and presence of the divine to express itself through this magnificent creative process. And there is only one way to work with the spirit, and that is to work with it consciously. It absolutely will not work for you if you do not use it. Do you hear me there? If you don't use it, it can't work. You can't drive a car unless you first turn on the ignition key. Oh wait, cars don't have keys anymore. Okay, you can't go anywhere unless you first get in the car. How about that? You can't go anywhere unless you first activate to choose to go to a place that's different from where you currently are. The field of infinite possibilities for good. Maybe this is the vehicle, huh? And we are in the driver's seat. And to try to cultivate a way of being in the world where we reach for God first, and yet we often forget to do this. And as religious scientists, we acknowledge that we are playing in a field of mind that is infinite, infinite in its power, infinite in its creativity. And I think sometimes we become a little afraid to use it, particularly newer students. That we are afraid we're going to say something wrong and activate this law in some crazy way to create calamity. Don't think like that, it's not serving anybody. You know, I know Dr. Moira and the other ministers pray so poetically, right? And maybe you feel like you don't do that, but you know what, you don't have to do that. 
right? You have your own song to express, your own song with the divine to co-create together in your own voice. Because I think sometimes we just overthink this whole proposition. What is important is that you pray. That is important. Praying, knowing that it's done. Praying in, within the formula of spiritual mind treatment, knowing that we are one with the divine, that there is this magnificent power and presence and uh, of, of with which we are playing, that we are the individualized expression of that. In this way, we are one with it, that our, vo- our word has power, for our word is impressing itself upon a law of mind, an aspect of the mind of the divine in some crazy cosmic way that takes that word and demonstrates it by the nature of its own being, by making the thing that it's thinking about out of the s- stuff it's already made out of. That's like some kind of crazy metaphysical strain, shall we say. <clears throat> so I think we do sometimes overthink the proposition. It's important that we pray. And I encourage you to pray out loud. Pray out loud in the privacy of your own home or, or in your car when you're driving around town. You know, in the old days when people saw you talking to yourself in your car, it's a problem, but now we have Bluetooth. No problem. They just think you're on the phone talking to somebody, right? So say that treatment out loud with feeling and with confidence, with confidence. The words are not as important as the feelings behind them. The spirit is not bound by any language in any way. It is the universal translator of love. And as all is of the one heart of the divine, the spirit knows our needs before we even utter them. There is power in saying them aloud, not to convince God, but maybe to convince ourselves that it is already done unto us as we believe. And so we step into further in this faith and knowing that our belief is strong because with the daily conscious use of the law, we have demonstrated it to ourselves. We're not taking Dr. Moira or Reverend Michael's word for it. We've demonstrated it for ourselves. That's the beauty of the teaching. And in that comes even more power as we grow in faith and belief and knowing that there is a power for good in the universe available to everyone and we can use it. So we must listen to the inner voice and it will tell us what to do in the hour of need. We will told everything we ought to know and we will not be misled. We must relight the torch of our imagination. By fire from heaven, we must remain faithful to this vision for a realization of the presence of God is the real power in our life. So just take a deep breath with me. And just set your intention for the week with me here, if you will. So let's just, again, consider how we are one with the divine, that we are the individualized expression of the one. And in this way, we know we have that within us That is a pattern of perfection within the body temple, within our mentality, within the very seat of the soul itself, that there is that flame of the divine awakening our rekindling with it. And so as we go about our day today, keeping holy the Sabbath, we consider that which we want to make manifest in our life through this week. And know that the power and presence of the divine is backing our play in every way. That we just release it with confidence. Take a deep breath. Release it. Let it go. And let it be so. Amen. Amen.